Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Environmental Science Video 13. It's on human population dynamics. Imagine you had $5,000 in the bank at 5% interest rate. How long would it take you to double your money to $10,000? Well, you'd have to go year by year. So it'd be 5,000 times 5%, which gives you $250 in the first year. We'd then have to take 5% of that and 5% of that. It's a really hard problem. Unless you understand the rule of 70, which is really simple, to figure out the time it takes to double your money, all you do is take the number 70 and you divide it by that percent, so divide it by 5, and it's going to take you approximately 14 years to double your money. Super easy to do. Let's say we have a population of 100 individuals, a growth rate of 7%. How long is it going to take that population to double to 200 in size? All you do is take 70 divided by that growth rate. 70 divided by 7 gives you 10 years. How long is it going to take you to double it again from 200 to 400? It's going to take another 10 years. And so you start to see this exponential growth of the population over time. So in the last video, we talked about the important characteristics of a population, the size, which can be increased and decreased. We then talked about other characteristics, density, distribution, age structure, sex ratio. So in this video, we're going to talk about how this all applies to the human population. We'll start with density and distribution. We'll then talk about the size and how that size has changed over time. It's very easy to calculate growth rate and now you know how to calculate the doubling time using the rule of 70. We'll talk specifically about birth rates using the fertility rate and death rates using the mortality rate and then how industrialization so the development of a country can lead to what's called the demographic transition and then finally we'll finish up with the age structure diagrams and these two things can be used as tools to predict the future population and so if we start with human density and distribution it's all over the place so if we look here in Montana it's less than two people per kilometer if we look in the in the US there are going to be way more people on the coasts way more people people in the Northeast, way more people in Western Europe, and way more people in Southeast Asia. In certain areas, it's going to be more than 500 per square kilometer. So there's unequal density and distribution. You can also see some neat patterns where there's desert. Obviously, there's not going to be a lot of people. We could look at the history of humans, which has maintained stability over a long period of time, but recently has shown exponential growth. Now, what led to that is going to be industrialization. So if you have access to constant food, constant in sanitation, good medicine, we see an increase in the population. Now, there are some blips along the way. There's going to be the bubonic plague where a third of the people in Europe died, but you can see over time we're seeing massive increases. What happens next? We'll talk more about that in the next video. And so if we look at the basic level, what's increasing a population? Births. What's decreasing it? deaths. And so we have what's called the rate of natural increase. And so the equation is simple. Rate of natural increase equals the crude birth rate minus the crude death rate divided by 10. And the reason we're dividing by 10 is these values are generally expressed per thousand people. So in 2013, the crude birth rate in Afghanistan was 34 people being born for every thousand people. Crude death rate is only eight. So if we want to figure out the rate of natural increase, we just plug those values in. 34 minus 8 is 26 divided by 10 is 2.6%. And so that means this population is going to be increasing over time. Now you could try one with the United States. If I give you the birth rate and the death rate, could you calculate that rate of natural increase? I hope so. I'll put the answer in the description down below. Now once we have that value, how much it's increasing, it's very easy to figure out the doubling time. So how do we do that? Remember that rule of 70. You simply take 70 divided by the increase percent, which is going to be 2.6, and then it's going to give us approximately 27 years. So what does that mean? The population in Afghanistan right now is 30 million, so in 27 years it will be 60 million. And so if it's 2013, right, when these values were given out, it's going to be 2040 when the population goes to 60 million. Now, is that super accurate? It may change over time, and I'm not really dealing dealing with immigration and emigration, but it's a simple, powerful tool that you can use. Now, what's changing the birth rate? We call that, demographers call that, the total fertility rate. That's going to be the number of births per woman during her reproductive period of time. And so if we look at what it is in Afghanistan, it's 4.9. So this imaginary woman who's, who's around today will, in general, have five children. 
if we look at it, what it is in the US, that number is going to be 1.9. So why do we such a, see such a huge difference between Afghanistan and the US? Well, let's talk globally for a second. So the TFR, total fertility rate, back in 1950, globally around the world, was 4.9. So it's closer to what Afghanistan is today. And you can see that it's decreased over time. So why do we see this decrease over time? Well, in developed countries, women are gonna have access to birth control, they're also gonna have access access to education uh, and employment. Therefore, they don't have to get married and start having kids right away for stability. So they're gonna have less kids over time. Now, a value that demographers will use is called the replacement level fertility. What does that value have to be to keep our population stable? And so you might think it's gonna be two because we have the mom and she has to replace herself and the dad. So you think it would be two, but due to mortality rate, it has to be a little bit higher. And in developing countries, it has has to be even a little bit higher than that to have a stable population. So if we look at those fertility rates, there's gonna be unequal distribution. So in the United States, the value is gonna be between one and two, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're gonna see really large values. That's because a lot of these are developing countries. Now we've only talked about the fertility rate and we haven't talked about the mortality rate. So if we look at the average lifespan in different countries, in a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa, that's gonna be really low. Like in Afghanistan, it's going to be the average average person only living between 45 and 50. Now disease, war can contribute to that. One of the best measures of how developed a country is, is the infant mortality rate. So in the US, that value is gonna be between five and nine per thousand people. But look at this, in some parts of Africa, that number is going to be approaching 100. In other words, one of 10 infants that are born are going to die. And so what I've been alluding to is this demographic transition. What happens as a country is industrialized? What happens as it goes to a, from a pre-industrial to a post-industrial country? And a really good model is called the demographic transition. So births are gonna be in green, deaths are going to be in red. And so if we look at the death rate, what happens to the death rate during industrialization? Well, it'll jump up and down, but eventually what happens is it drops way down and it remains stable. So once we have access to constant food, sanitation, medicine, we're gonna decrease that death rate profoundly. If we look at what happens to the birth rate over time, you'll see that it also decreases, but it shifted to the right a little bit. And so if we look back at this model of size being increased by births and, and decreased by deaths, what do you think is gonna happen pre-industrial? Well, if these birth and death rates are essentially the same, now they're moving up and down, what's gonna happen to our population, which I've graphed over here on the right, it's gonna remain stable. As we move into this transitional period, watch what happens. First thing that happens is the death rate will drop off during industrialization, but it takes a while for people to realize that and start having less children. And so it takes a while for the birth rate to drop off. And so if we have a population where the birth rate is higher than the death rate, think about this down here, if more births are coming in than deaths are leaving, we're gonna see a massive exponential increase in the population. What happens as these two approach each other during the industrial phase, as the birth rate eventually drops to the death rate, you could imagine that it's gonna stabilize again. And then what's happening post-industrial, eventually we see the population dropping off. So we can see this in a lot of countries. Again, it's just a model, so it's not gonna be perfect, but we can look at countries who've gone through this and allow it to make allow us to make predictions about what's gonna to happen to countries in the future. So in certain countries, we can see the demographic transition occurred. So this is Sweden. What we're looking at here is going to be the birth rates in blue and then the death rates in red. So if we look way back in time in the 1700s, there's a huge increase in death rates. So this was a smallpox outbreak. But what happens over time is the death rate drops off first and then the birth rate drops off second. And then you can see they reached each other at the same point. So what happened to the population of Sweden during this demographic transition? It increased and then it became stable. A good way to look at where a population is and where it's headed is using something called an age structure diagram. And so on an age structure diagram, we'll put males on one side, females on the other, and then the percent they make up of the population. 
And so if you're a female watching this and you're 18 right now, we could find you right here. So you'd be right here. So in this country, you'd make up around 7% of the population. Now, if we see an age structure diagram like this, where we don't have many people that are very old and we have lots of young people, this is going to be a population that is just increasing, just going through that demographic transition. If, however, we get an age structure diagram that looks like this, where it's pretty much straight on the sides, this is going to be a more stable population. Now, this would be what the United States looks like. And you can even see the baby boomers, this large group of, of babies that were born after World War II, and they're just going to work their way up through the age structure diagram. If we look at this demographic transition, where is this going to be? Right there. But if we look at a country like Japan, at the bottom, we're not going to have many youth at all. And so where is that going to be? We're going to call that post-industrial. Now, there are going to be advantages and disadvantages of each of these, but we'll talk about those in the next video. And so did you learn the following, that the human population characteristics of our density, distribution, sex ratio, age structure, which we can see in an age structure diagram. The size is the most important thing. We can use the growth rate to figure out the doubling time. But what are the other two things that contribute to that? birth rate and mortality rate or fertility rate and mortality rate. Remember, industrialization is going to bring about the demographic transition and we can use these two tools to predict the future. We'll talk more about what the future holds for humans, but I hope that was helpful.